I, am, I think I'm ready. I, I hope I'm ready. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to another uh, and the final session of ASM Live at ICAC, coming to you from Chicago this year, as uh, ICAC is the American Society for Microbiology Infectious Diseases annual meeting. And uh, during these sessions, we've been talking with participants on a variety of subjects dealing with infectious disease. Uh, for those of you who are, oh, I should introduce myself too. I'm Jeffrey Fox, the features editor of Microbe, which is the American Society for Microbiology's monthly magazine. Uh, for those of you watching on the web, if you'd like to ask a question, use hashtag ICAC. And for those of you in the room, you now know the drill. Raise your hand. I'll tr we'll try to spot you promptly and uh, identify yourself by name and affiliation. And uh, I, I was also been prompted to remind you that you are welcome, uh, invited to ask questions early. Don't don't wait for me to stop talking. I I try to keep talking, but there's no reason for you not to ask your questions with equal priority or higher priority. Now, on to our uh, two guests. Uh, to my immediate left, Arian Dondorp of the uh, Maidal Oxford Research Unit in Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, to his left, Scott Dowell of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we'll be talking on, uh, th they will be talking about two very different uh, infectious disease subjects, uh, and I'm going to uh, give them time now to uh, give us a brief overview of, of each of your subjects, uh, starting with uh, Aryan. Thank you very much. So the talk I gave this morning was about the emergence of uh, artemisinin resistance in falciparum malaria. Uh, which is a very important topic in uh, malaria control and treatment because the, uh, all the drugs that we use, almost all the drugs we use at the moment, are based on these artemisinin compounds. So for the treatment of uncomplicated malaria, we use artemisinin combination therapies. Uh, that's WHO first-line treatment recommended for all malaria endemic countries. And we use artesunate uh, parenteral, so in, uh, intravenously mainly for first-line treatment of severe malaria. So uh, if resistance against those compounds are emerging, that, is, uh, would, that would be a disaster for malaria control. And there are signs now that this is in fact happening in, in, on the Thai-Cambodian border. Uh, it's not complete resistance, but uh, the hallmark of the artemisinins used to be very fast parasite clearance, where you get rid of your, all your parasites in the blood in, in two days. Uh, that time has now been severely prolonged and has uh, more than doubled in that area. Um, when you use the drug as a combination therapy in uncomplicated malaria, that is still quite effective, but uh, still it's very worrying that it is the step towards also failing of the combination therapy. Um, there are a lot of research questions still uh, going on uh, that are important to address, like uh, how do we exactly define this uh, resistance, what are the molecular markers, what are better tests in the laboratory to identify those parasites. Uh, but waiting for this, that those answers would take too long, so there is now a, a containment program started uh, under the guidance of the WHO uh, to try to contain the resistant parasite within that relatively uh, small area on the Thai-Cambodian border. Uh, that is going on at the moment. It's quite uh, effective. The, uh, nevertheless, there are worrying signs that this resistance might have spread already, so that the net of this containment uh, program might be, have to be increased. Um, so maybe as an introduction, that uh, is Good. enough information. All right, and, and Scott, please. <coughs> 
Yeah, it's uh, been almost one year since the cholera was introduced to Haiti for the first time. And uh, in that one year, it's uh, now become clear that the cholera epidemic in Haiti is certainly one of the largest epidemics in modern history and uh, also one of the best documented and arguably one of the best managed in terms of cholera mortality. Okay. Uh all right, no immediate questions from the audience here. Yes, an immediate question. Can we have a microphone, Jim? <laughs> to the middle. This is middle, ma middle management. Hi, I'm Marin McKenna from Wired.com. Um, so a question about um, uh, artemisinin resistance. Is this because of is this a natural emergence of resistance, or is there something um, something wrong in the administration of the drug, or the use of the drugs, or the structure of the program for distributing them? Um, well, uh, a bit of both. Um, the Artemis, it was recognized when they were introduced that we should prevent the emergence of resistance. So they were deployed as combination therapies where the partner drug uh, protects the artemisinin component against the development of uh, resistance. Uh, and Cambodia was very early with adopting that policy, changing to artemisinin combination therapies. But uh, in the private sector, there was a lot of artemisinin monotherapy around and uh, a lot of substandard and fake drugs, up to 40% of the drugs that you buy in the pharmacies uh, used to be fake drugs. Um, so there was a lot of drug pressure on the parasite population for a long, long time, since the 80s. So that is in, in Cambodia, yeah. So there has been a lot of drug pressure on, the, on those parasites, and uh, that's, uh, that certainly will have played a role. It, it is still peculiar that it has emerged in exactly there, and not in the neighboring countries that had similar uh, problems. So just to clarify. <laughs> so just to clarify. Um, part of the issue here is that the the malaria drugs are dispensed over the counter, um, that people are just, they're, they're going to their village shop or whatever <clears> to buy them. Yes, yeah, so uh, surveys from the uh, beginning of the century show that the, over 70% of the patients don't, didn't go to the government sector but to the private sector for their health care if they have a fever. Uh, and there they got the wrong therapies often. It has improved a lot now since the containment uh, project, but that used to be the case. Um, I'm Terry Murray from the Medical Post of Toronto. Um, what, is the, um, what is the containment program? Um, yeah, th this is, is a whole booklet that describes it in, in uh, detail. It's called GPARC, the Global Plan for Artemisinin Resistance Containment. Uh, so uh, a lot of experts came together to, uh, to write that document. Uh, the plan has, uh, divides the region in three tiers, tier one, two, three. Tier one is where artemisinin resistance has really been identified, tier two, uh, is the adjacent, directly adjacent area. Tier 3 is where no resistance has been uh, noted yet. And in this Tier 3, there is uh, very intense malaria control measures, like 100% cover, coverage of the population with insecticide impregnated bed nets, and a system of uh, village malaria workers, where every small village has, has a layperson trained to make a malaria diagnosis with a rapid diagnostic test and provide appropriate anti-malarial treatment. And then uh, part of it was also to, uh, to uh, get the monotherapies out of the private sector and exchange them with uh, artemisinin combination therapies of good quality. And there's an effort to reach this uh, migrant population. There are quite a few migrant workers in the area and they are potentially the people who, who take the malaria parasites 
in their blood to other areas and can, which can cause spread of the resistant phenotype. Um, I've also got a question for uh, Dr. Dell. Um, for those of us who weren't at your talk this morning, um, your overview was um, like from about 35,000 feet. Yes. I'm just wondering if you could bring it, if you could expand on that. Come down to 10,000 feet. Something like that. 10,000, plan to. So um, the epidemic uh, began in the Artibonite Valley in the Santra region of uh, Haiti in uh, October of last year. It spread very, very quickly uh, to essentially all departments of Haiti within several weeks. Some of the things we talked about in the presentation were the early studies looking at risk factors for infection, which uh, focused on the drinking of un untreated water, not just the water from the Artibonite River, but any source of untreated water and mortality that told us that the deaths were occurring amongst people who couldn't get to facilities fast enough, but also amongst people who got to facilities and were not well managed. So the early part of the epidemic response focused on trying to get that mortality down uh, by training clinicians in a nationwide rollout of training uh, to try and get Haitian clinicians who'd never experienced cholera before uh, up on treating patients with rapidly dehydrating diarrhea very, very quickly. And that was successful in bringing the mortality from the initial 4% uh, in the first month or so of the, of the epidemic down below 1% by February, and it stayed essentially that way since then. Um, so the, a lot of credit goes to the Ministry of Public Health in Haiti for organizing both the training and the surveillance system that has monitored the outbreak since the beginning, and uh, to many, many organizations, NGOs, and others from around the world who've helped to take care of cholera patients. But by any measure, whether you look at total number of cases of cholera in the last year, or total cases per 100,000 population, the Haitian cholera epidemic is far greater than uh, recent years, African cholera epidemics or any of the epidemics in Latin America uh, beginning after the 1991 introduction. So it's an enormous epidemic, but the response has been good at, at minimizing mortality. And in terms of the future, um, we uh, ended with a discussion about control of cholera in Haiti, something that the Haitian legislature and the new president has called for. Our perspective is that it is feasible. We've seen it controlled in other Latin American countries, and it will depend largely on the success in getting clean chlorinated water to all Haitians, in addition to hygiene and sanitation measures. But clean chlorinated water, we believe, can render um, cholera, if not eliminate it from Haiti, at least eliminate the threat of epidemic cholera from Haiti for the future. So you do think it's there to stay? <clears throat> or is it too soon to, to make a judgment of that sort? So cholera can become endemic. It, it can, uh, we, we, we've documented that it is in water sources around Haiti. In brackish water, it can become endemic in, um, in the water, in the shellfish, and so forth. And there's documentation that it is in Haitian shellfish and crustaceans. So um, it is possible that it will persist for some time, but there isn't a reason that it has to be an epidemic threat. So cholera from Haiti has been introduced more than half a dozen times to the U.S., for example, also an immunologically naive population, and that hasn't spread at all. So cholera in the setting of adequate water and sanitation does not have to be an epidemic threat. Yeah, you say it was introduced from, from Haiti to the U.S. just in this year or, or historically in, in other periods? Right, no, it's, um, so uh, we, we look back to see when cholera was in Haiti before October of last year, and we couldn't find a single thing. That the closest we came was a little documentation in 1916 when the U.S. Marines occupied Haiti, and there was a little page of a notebook that said <coughs> half a dozen cholera cases or so, but we don't really think that was cholera. It wasn't microbiologically confirmed. So up until October of last year, there was no cholera in Haiti. Since October of last year, there have been a series of individuals who traveled to Haiti, developed cholera, came back to the U.S., but failed to spread it. And uh, so the, the, the lesson there, and it's not a new lesson, is that 
cholera is not an epidemic threat if water and sanitation is adequate. Um, <clears throat> in the case of Haiti, though, that's a big if. Yeah, it's pricey. Uh, estimates are right around a billion dollars to get all Haitians access to clean, chlorinated water and adequate sanitation. And in how much time? Well, um, after the earthquake, January 12th, 2010, uh, countries around the world pledged support to Haiti, uh, totaling about six to seven billion dollars. So the pledges are there. If those pledges are delivered on, um, we believe uh, clean chlorinated water can be provided to Haitians rather quickly. Not necessarily through municipal water systems right away across the whole country, but there are other measures being taken for home chlorination of water supplies, which could be also be effective. And one of the interesting things that we've seen since the epidemic is the extent to which Haitians are willing to chlorinate their own water in their households. It's been an uphill challenge in many places before, but I, I think the fear and the ongoing fear of cholera for Haitians has meant that chlorination of water and, and drinking clean water has become a priority for people around Haiti. So there's an opportunity there. So um, I just have a, a couple of questions, and I want to sort of pepper you with all of them at the risk of losing most of them, but how, how much time do you think it will take to um, stop this outbreak? That's hard to say. Um, the, the epidemic curve shows us that the big peak of cases occurred in November and December of last year. Uh, the number of cases decreased through the summer and then increased again um, in the late summer, uh, coincident with the onset of rains. Um, the sense of many uh, is that uh, cholera will persist in Haiti, uh, perhaps in association with rainy seasons, for some time to come. But we're really pretty bad about predicting the future. So uh, we, we said, uh, CDC put out uh, some uh, pre-decision briefs uh, right after the earthquake, um, specifying what should be done in the event of epidemics we were worried about. And what we said about cholera at that time is, Cholera is not a big worry. It's unlikely to come to Haiti because it's never been there before. So we've, we've, we've been wrong quite enough about predicting the future, so we're a little bit cautious about that. I think what I would say about the future of cholera in Haiti is we do firmly believe that it is controllable if uh, clean water and sanitation can be brought to Haitians. So would you say, and this is sort of echoing Jeff's question, is it, is it now considered endemic? But you, you foresee it not becoming, or uh, epidemics becoming controlled? Yeah, um, at what, I don't know, I don't know at what point one considers uh, endemic. It's been 11 months since it's been introduced, so it's there, it's probably there to stay for a while. Our goal uh, would not be to eliminate cholera completely from Haiti, but rather to eliminate the risk of epidemic cholera from Haiti. So, um, again, by analogy with the U.S., we have cholera cases that occur in the U.S. from uh, cholera infected, usually shellfish along the Gulf Coast states every year, but epidemic cholera is not a threat to the U.S., so we would love to see Haiti in that, in that situation. Um, Scott, there's been, there's been a lot of attention to the allegation, which I think now has been pretty well supported, that it was actually relief troops to Haiti that imported cholera. Um, does that matter? I mean, in the sense of, of you know, it demonstrates that diseases spread, but aside from that, is Haiti owed anything because of that importation? Uh, is it significant that it was brought from outside? Yeah, yes, we, we think it's important to understand how pathogens travel from continent to continent and country to country, and so understanding how cholera may have been introduced to Haiti has been something of interest to us and others from the beginning. Um, it uh, was not the most urgent thing uh, when the epidemic was unfolding and people were dying, and, and is, is, is still is the case, but it's not something that should be, uh, should be put aside. As you said, the circumstantial evidence pointing to the introduction of cholera as a point source is quite strong. Uh, the evidence pointing to the fact that it was introduced in or around the town of Mirbalay is rather strong. And um, 
the Nepalese battalion which camped around that area, there's also additional circumstantial evidence that the origin may, uh, the cholera that came to Haiti is most genetically similar to cholera strains that were circulating in Nepal. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence about that. Um, I think what's important is what lessons that gives us in a country like Haiti, which is epidemiologically vulnerable, uh, and the recommendations that we can make for whether it's relief organizations or travelers going to vulnerable countries. And so uh, reminding people that travel to vulnerable places that they should, in addition to thinking about protecting themselves, need to think about protecting the country in, to, to which they're going is important. And so um, being aware of not traveling if you're sick, being aware that if you're setting up um, encampments or um, going to another country that control of communicable diseases, whether it's through hand washing, um, respiratory etiquette, or control of sewage uh, are all important steps that can be taken. These are, I think, uh, the Haiti situation is a reminder of that. We've had many similar reminders of that in recent years. Um, can you give us any numbers on the like scope of the uh, epidemic to date? Numbers of people affected, numbers of deaths. Yeah, I could I could go to the the website. The Haitian Ministry of Public Health uh, puts uh, the current numbers up on the website okay. uh, very precisely. Um, the, it's roughly four hundred and fifty thousand cases of cholera that have been reported since the beginning, and about six thousand, uh, a little over six thousand deaths. So that makes it far larger than any other recent cholera outbreaks. All right, I have a, I want to go back to malaria uh, drug resistance. Uh, and and it's, I, I've heard from visits to this meeting and in the past and this year that artemisinin and resistance is not restricted to the zone you're looking at. Uh, and I'm uh, curious as to what you know or what is known about the comparable comparability of those resistance uh, uh, outbreaks. Are, are they the same, different? And, and, and what impact would, might that have in terms of uh, the, the approach you're taking to restrict or uh, control the, the outbreak in your neighborhood? Uh, along the Cambodian-Thai border. Yeah, so the fear is that uh, it will that it will spread or emerge somewhere else. You can't really tell it at the moment. From the Cambodian-Thai border to the Thai-Myanmar border, and once it, once it is in Myanmar, where malaria control is much more difficult, it will spread to Bangladesh, India, and then to the African continent, what has happened in the past with chloroquine resistance and Fonsidar resistance, which was were uh, 10, 20 years ago, the, the drugs being used to treat malaria. Um, and then chloroquine resistance, for instance, has caused a lot of deaths in, in African children after that. So that's the fear. Uh, there are some early signs that it might have emerged or spread to the Thai-Myanmar border by surveillance, uh, uh, quite crude surveillance uh, studies, looking at how many people still have parasites in their blood uh, 72 hours, three days after start of the treatment. That is now being investigated uh, more in detail, whether that is indeed the same sort of uh, observations we have made in Western Cambodia. And uh, we are assisted by that by molecular techniques, whether that are the same uh, parasites. Um, it's still a bit too early to be absolutely sure about that, but it is worrying enough that uh, the WHO has decided that uh, from an operational point of view, it should be regarded as already, already present there. So now there's also a Myanmar uh, containment program started there focused on the border region and Myanmar. See, so, so maybe the premise of my question was wrong. Uh, this is the, the, the only global hot, hot spot in the world of artemisinin 
resistance. Yes, yes. Ah, so okay. the, there were a few reports indeed that from African countries, they said they also saw this phenomenon of increased clearance time. Uh, that is probably not due to artemisinin resistance, but rather that malaria has gone down a lot in, in many African countries uh, because of the introduction of these artemisinin combination therapies together with bed net use. And because of that, people lose their immunity against the disease. And then if they get malaria and are treated, they clear the infection a bit slower because their own immune system assists a bit l less than in the past. Uh, and, and so at, the, at this point, you, you, there's nothing, not much known about the mechanism of, of this resistance, the, the molecular nature of what's going on with the parasite? Yes, that, that a lot of research is going on there at the moment. We know a few things. We know it is a, a heritable trait, so it, it is something in a change in the, in the genome of the parasite or epigenetic factors. Um, what the responsible genes are, we don't know yet at the moment, uh, but uh, that is being studied at the moment with whole genome sequencing, 1,500 parasite isolates will be uh, sequenced, so you have the whole genome of the parasites from susceptible and resistant parasites, and that hopefully will give us the resistant genes that are uh, responsible for this. And continuing along this same line of thought, you've, uh, what, Thailand has converted over, it seems, exclusively to artemisinin dual therapy for malaria. So is that because it's, the assumption is that everything is chloroquine resistant? I mean, would, would there be any benefit from adding those drugs back so that you, you, you could better control this, this outbreak that's partially artemisinin resistant? Yeah, so the problem at the moment is that there are no other drugs uh, really available. So chloroquine is useless for fossiprim malaria in that part of the world because of high-grade resistance still present there. It's still present. Still present. Same for Fancidar, sulfadoxin pyrimethamine, also a, a good drug in the past, also cheap, now useless. Um, also, d drugs that were in the development pipeline were all based on artemisinin combinations. So there is a real problem there, and we don't have a lot of alternatives at the moment. And you, earlier, uh, when we were chatting, you said that there are some promising uh, drugs, not, not approved yet, but there are some hopeful signs of drugs becoming available. There are a few new drugs uh, being tested uh, in phase two, uh, three trials now at the moment. Uh, one of them are the uh, synthetic endoperoxides that they look a little bit like the artemisinins, but the molecule looks quite different. Um, they work in uh, sensitive malaria, artemisinin sensitive malaria. The next step will B, whether they work also in resistant malaria, and that is a bit too early to tell at the moment. All right, uh, we, we have another question in the room, and are there any questions from the internet? I'll ask Jim if that's... Oh, go ahead, Terry. Um, is WHO or other national ministries of health doing anything in other countries like taking a lesson from this area to prevent the development of resistance in terms of um, ensuring that the monotherapy isn't used and um, you know taking up taking other steps. Uh, yes, so WHO, they have, they have banned Ar artemisinin monotherapies, uh, but it's of course difficult to reinforce, but uh, also companies uh, uh, take their responsibility not to, uh, not to sell monotherapies anymore. Um, that is quite effective in Southeast Asia, I'm not sure about, uh, about Africa at the moment. 
the problem remains that uh, in a lot of the countries the, the health structure is quite weak and, and patients go to the shop, to the pharmacy for their, for their anti-malarial treatment. And that is much more difficult to regulate, uh, of course. Well, uh, would, would either of you like to have a, a final thought, share a final thought with us before we uh, bring the session to a close? Any, uh, anything you forgot to tell us or, or, or expect to be doing in the next six months, maybe, in these different settings? Well, maybe just to stress the urgency of the problem, because, uh, as I said, it's really, uh, there's not a lot of other anti-malarials available, and we don't want the same happen again what used with, with what happened with the spread of chloroquine resistance, that mortality uh, in kids in Africa goes up again because the parasite is not uh, sensitive anymore. And that, but there is a lot of attention from, uh, from a lot of groups, uh, donors also, to realize that this is an important problem to uh, contain. Scott? I enjoyed our session. I, I, it was a very wide-ranging session, and I, I think it was a reminder to me about everything that's new and exciting about infectious diseases. And we, we heard about uh, penicillin resistance among uh, Neisseria meningitidis. We heard about uh, falciparum resistance. We, Heard about another resistance, oh, helmets, resistance among helmets, who would have thunk? And, uh, and then cholera in Haiti, so it was uh, wide ranging but interesting. Okay, well, I, I want to thank uh, my, my two guests here Aryan Dondorp of the Mahidol Oxford Research Unit in Bangkok, Thailand, and Scott Dowell of uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and I want to thank all of you who have uh, been our visitors uh, over the internet and in the room. Uh, this is the last session of ASM Live at ICAC for 2011. And with any luck, we'll see you again next year or in the spring at the ASM general meeting. Thanks very much. And thank you. Thank you.